So welcome to the second day of our complexity methods workshop. Um, in this first session, we have uh, two very interesting talks. Um, first of all, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Peter Schlote. Um, he leads uh, a research group in uh, computational science and complexity at the University of Amsterdam. Um, he's been given various awards in 1996, uh, an NNV Distinguished Professor in Computational Physics, and more recently in 2010, uh, he was given the uh, prestigious Leading, science, Leading Scientist Award um, from the uh, Russian Federation. Uh, he, cho he, chairs, or he, holds, he holds a chair at the University of Amsterdam uh, in Computational Science, and uh, another chair at St. Petersburg in Complex Systems, and he's also uh, a visiting professor at uh, NTU uh, here in Singapore. So, Peter. So um, I'm glad you made it this morning. And I'm actually glad I made it this morning. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I see that the guys that were with me last night did not make it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, what I will do is I will, uh, I will talk a bit about um, uh, some recent results that we have in the field of uh, uh, complex networks and complex, complex agent networks. And, um, it's pretty good to have a, an hour to talk, so normally I talk faster than I can think, so now maybe I can think a bit while talking. And, um, so let, let me see. We live in a complex world, that has been said many times during, uh, during these days, and um, we do. I mean, if you start to think of it, you know, if you start to think of these small molecules that build these large micromolecules that build the cells of our body, and then the cells that build our organelles, and the organelles that build the organs, all the way up to the um, to the actual body, actual body if you like. But then also all these people are interacting uh, in a pretty complex uh, way. So it really goes all the way, if you like, from, from molecule to man. And um, so here I have a, uh, uh, a nice animation of, uh, if we talk about man, a nice animation of what's happening now in the world. I don't know if you can see it, but let me just take you through it. Um, we are on the edge of reaching 7 billion people. While we're looking at here, you know, you just see this is a real-time uh, a real -time thing. Um, so the population now says 6.9 million people. While I'm talking, uh, you probably see about uh, a couple of thousand people being born. <laughs> um, but also interesting things on this, uh, this um, uh, real-time thing is, um, the, well, the population growth, of course, but also things like the, um, the amount of people that die and where they die from. And so here, um, let's first look at, the, uh, at, the, at this part here. Here we have the HIV infections, which um, during this year is uh, 3.5 million people. That's quite a lot, I would say. That's just during this year. So if we, if we tune this thing down to, uh, let's say, what happens uh, in the month, then uh, the typical amount of people per month is like 250,000 people getting infected in the world, which is pretty impressive for a large number. Then if you look at the deaths um, over the last month, so it's like, uh, like 3 million, and dying from AIDS uh, and uh, related uh, sexual transmitted diseases, about 170,000. So that's a serious problem. It's really a serious problem. And while the numbers are growing, uh, these numbers are still growing too, these numbers of, uh, of diseases. So um, let me see if I can connect this thing. Um, So it's indeed a com complex world. And the kind of things that, that this, this big society is facing um, is shown over here. Here on the, uh, the y-axis, we have the relative impact of uh, catastrophes happening. On the, y, on the uh, uh, x-axis, we have the relatively likelihood of something happening. And uh, so the kind of things that really you know, uh, keeps our society busy, so to say, are these, these problems over here, like things like coastal flooding, inland flooding, but also this thing like pandemic. And if you look at the pandemic part, it is the one that has a pretty high, almost the highest likelihood of happening. And if it happens, it has the highest impact in our society. This is a, this is a study that is done in the, in the UK. It's been reconfirmed by a big study in the United States. And this is kind of really like a worldwide, worldwide map of uh, disasters and their impact. Now, neither of these problems, if you think about it, neither of these problems is monodisciplinary. 
understanding it, preventing it, and uh, reducing, let's say, the effect of it really requires a complete multidisciplinary approach. Not only multidisciplinary, but also um, because of the fact that we have this, uh, that, that we are involved there, extremely complex. So, what I will be talking about is uh, pandemics. And most notably, I'm talking about HIV. And what I'm trying to do uh, during this hour is take you from the top to the bottom. Uh, we'll start with, you know, how do we look at this big society in which we live? How do we look at the way we interact with each other in terms of uh, transmission of diseases? And then I will take you down to the molecule. And I will show you in the meantime that, well, of course, it's, it's clear that it's pretty hard to do this. Um, but that complexity methods really help us to uh, appreciate the complexity, but also to, um, uh, to tame the complexity, to quote nature here. OK, well, size, well, if you talk about these kind of problems, then size does matter. Um, you know, the, the processes of the transcription of the uh, RNA, you know, uh, HIV is an RNA uh, uh, virus, uh, takes place on, on this uh, spatial temporal scale, uh, whereas, you know, the actual uh, processing in the body take up on, on, a, on a scale like here. And there's no computer program whatsoever that can track this. Think about it for a few seconds. If I want to simulate one second of, let's say, a transcription process, if I want to simulate that in a computer, uh, in order to get numerical stability, I need to make 10 to the power 14 steps, which is about 10 to the power 14 floating point operations, which is quite a lot, for one second of simulation of one molecule. Uh, or two molecules. Um, so dragging that all the way up to, let's say, a uh, lifetime, there's absolutely no way to, you can do that if you want to do that. So the thing that you want to do here is to try to understand the hierarchy of these processes. So what's happening here, what's happening here, what's happening there, on all these different levels. You want to have models and then copy that hierarchy uh, together uh, in a sensible way. Now, that's not complicated, that's complex. Okay, now one way to show what we are constantly doing when we want to do this research, and I'm talking about research that, that, that I started like 15 years ago, um, although I will give you pretty hot results that we just obtained a week ago. Um, if you want to study these things, then, um, then you're constantly looking for, let's say, new models to capture the processes, to understand the data, to predict uh, the processes. Now, these models, we all know, um, if, we, if we use you know, differential equations, it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, you will stop within a few seconds because it just doesn't work. It's not good enough. Um, so the way we, the things we have been doing is looking for computational vehicles. And that can be anything from agent-based models to um, cellular automata to whatever you have there. And um, the thing I would like to focus on today is complex networks where the nodes are agents. Because this is a tool workshop, I thought that would, be, uh, that would fit. Now this is a network, um, uh, maybe even a complex network. And this is a network of a, um, a high, school, uh, dating, high school dating graph, if you like. So um, look at it for a few seconds. <laughs> so the, the, um, the blue ones are the boys. And the red ones are the girls. And this comes from a, from a survey in the United States from a high school where the survey was, OK, who did you date uh, during the last week? Whom will you date the coming two weeks? And um, uh, without asking more, more details than that. And, um, and then they just laid out this graph. Well, that's kind of interesting. So what you see here, like I said, the boys, I did have a very happy boy here. <laughs> <laughs> and there are some happy girls somewhere. Um, I think I was around here somewhere. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so, so you got the idea. The idea is that, that the links, they identify how people are connected. And the, the balls, if you like, they identify the individuals. Now, an individual is, is not a binary thing. An individual is something which is pretty complex. Um, and so the way we want to look at this, if we want to study um, infectious diseases, is that these links in the, in the identify the transmission of the virus um, and these individuals in that we want to capture all these molecular, virological and medical uh, processes. So it is kind of a very nice vehicle, if you like, of modeling 
pretty complex things and, 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 and building this hierarchy that I was talking about. And they can get very, very uh, hairy. Um, now, I have to say a few words about these networks before I, I actually dig into uh, uh, how we use that. So, um, I mean, small world, small world networks, they are pretty well known. I just want to kind of uh, repeat what you probably already know. Um, if you look at just the connectivity of the people across the world, you can say, okay, everybody is somehow connected to someone, and this creates this big hairball of connections. Um, but then, even though there is a big hairball, you can have very simple measures of that. Simple, let's say, quantitative metrics identifying <coughs> the structure of these big hairballs. Uh, and one identifying thing is, you know, how many handshakes are people away from each other? So just pick two random people in the world and just look at how many handshakes they are away. So um, I'm, uh, now here's an example. In March, I was uh, visiting Medvedev uh, uh, in, uh, in Moscow. That's me. So I'm one handshake away from uh, Medvedev, who is one handshake away from Barack Obama, which means that I'm two handshakes away from Barack Obama. Now, if you would measure those things for everybody in the world, anybody everywhere, then the average distance is about six. So within six handshakes, you are, uh, you can cross the whole, the whole complex network. So even, even though it's pretty complex, it can have relatively simple topological uh, 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 metrics. And this topology is important. Uh, here are a couple of other examples. Uh, people expected when they were looking at the, uh, at the World Wide Web, they expected it would have you know, an amount of connections of each document. They expected that it would be like uh, just a normal distribution where this is the uh, uh, amount of connections per document and this is the probability of the amount of connections. But what they found is that it's actually uh, looking like this. And this was a pretty important discovery in 1999 by Barabasi et al. Um, where they actually found that these networks, these real-life networks, are not normal distributed, but they have this scale-free distribution. So this means that the probability of finding, let's say, three connections in an, uh, with an individual um, is given by three to the power of some kind of, some kind of uh, gamma here. So that means that even though those networks can be tremendously complicated, you only need one parameter. This is really nice. You only need this gamma to describe this complex network. So like I said, in the small world network where you only have like this diameter which gives you a good feeling of what the network is about, in a complex network, as these things are called, which are these, these scale -free, uh, which has these scale-free properties, there's only one parameter that identifies that network. Which is good, because if I want, if I can from my data infer the fact that the network is scale-free, I know I can simulate such networks by just, you know, simulating a network with a certain gamma. Okay, there are many examples um, like that. Uh, science co-authorships, they also seem to be um, uh, scale-free, uh, same kind of scale-free behavior. And so you can also model them the same way. Same thing like the structure of organizations. If you analyze that, um, you find the same scale-free behavior. Uh, and uh, here are a couple of examples. One of the things that worked that we've done ourselves which is looking into the, um, the network of proteins between the, the, the human proteins and the uh, HIV uh, proteins. Um, and they, uh, they are also, this network is also completely scale-free. Um, and here's some interesting work that was done by XE and some work done by Marvel on, on the sociology of networks, or better, using the networks to describe sociological processing. So here's a nice example that um, in social, in, in a, in a in a sociological process where you want to study the way opinions, if you like, opinions percolate through a uh, social population, um, you can show that, first of all, that these, are, these, these uh, uh, populations are scale-free, but you can also show that if 10% or more has a certain opinion, eventually the whole population will have that opinion. That was kind of an interesting uh, discovery. And these things you can uh, really measure and can understand at least to some extent by modeling them. The thing that you were shown here is uh, the changing of opinion. Maybe I can run this thing again. Um, that's the changing of opinion um, under stress. So, um, <coughs> so here basically, this is uh, the, 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 the green ones are the uh, and the red ones are two different opinions about about a topic. Um, then you put the system under stress, 
and you can actually see that the uh, opinions separate each other. And this is, for instance, happening, and this, this model is pretty good, um, when you're looking at uh, the way votes change over the period just before the election. And uh, so this seems to be like a very uh, reliable model for that. Okay, so this is just to give you a feeling of what those complex networks uh, amount to and how you might be able to use that. Okay, so um, let me see if I can switch to the next slide. Um, let's look a bit at, I said this, this topology was important, so let's look a bit at it, what, what the consequences are. Um, and I find this really very interesting, so let, let's have a look at, uh, at this. A complex network, scale-free, the scale-free means that if I change this k for a k, I just get the same behavior. Um, it has pretty, pretty strange uh, characteristics, so let me just show you um, how to create one like that. So this is just a simulation of how you create a network like that. It has these characteristics of, uh, um, of p to the power of uh, k to the power of gamma. Um, and the size here of each uh, sphere indicates the amount of connection that it has. So this guy, this is a, uh, a one with many connections and there are one with coupled with uh, very few connections. So this is the way you create those things. Um, it's by now becoming an art, actually, uh, to create this. Now, the thing is, if you, I don't know how good your math is, but if you just look at this equation and you would calculate the first moment and the second moment, you will directly see that something strange is happening around a comma s2 and comma s3. And uh, what's happening there is actually the following. When we have uh, a situation then where that comma is around about 3, um, then these networks become uh, uh, pretty sensitive. Um, and what's happening here is for such a network, we should consider it like balloons that are connected. We shoot at those balloons. And uh, if we randomly shoot at those balloons for these kind of networks, you see that the, that the network still has, uh, is more or less consistent, it's more or less coherent. It's still, it's a still alive. I can still be connect, I still connect from here to any other place in the network. Right? It's still alive, even though I have already shot 28 uh, balloons out of it. Now, if I do a selective shooting, um, so that should be, I guess, this one. Um, so now I only shoot the ones that will have the high connections. So now I start to shoot at the big balls, if you like. And you see that already after six shots, the whole network disintegr disintegrates. So transmitting information from one side to the network to another side of the network becomes impossible. And this is a typical characteristic of those complex networks, that they become very sensitive to um, how you attack them, if you like. And that's not only, of course, for removing uh, nodes from the network, but it's also for adding nodes to the network. So this gives us a bit of a feeling of the, let's say, the, um, the kind of things that we can expect when we uh, study the um, uh, the, the resilience of, of those networks. I'll skip this part. Okay, now, um, it, it's been a pretty active research area uh, ever since its discovery, if you like, of, uh, of Badabasi. And uh, let me just compare it for you um, with other research areas which are all somehow related to complexity. Because if you look into the complexity field, you will find a lot of papers on chaos, a lot of papers on fractional neural networks, self-organized criticality, and also networks. So here what you see is um, the uh, amount of uh, papers uh, that have been published over the years in the different fields. So here we have the field of chaos, the field uh, that, that's doing, uh, what is the field of, uh, no, anyway. So you have, but then if you look at the, uh, at the fractals, you see there are a lot more papers there being published, and actually still pretty uh, active, also uh, self-organized criticality, which is basically dying out now. Um, but then if you look in the field of complex networks, it goes like that. So it is a tremendously active research area. And the reason why it's so tremendously active is, it is of its omnipresence in, uh, in everything, from, from, from society to, mo to molecule. It's a very useful methodology to understand the, uh, uh, the way nonlinear um, uh, elements are in interacting with each other and show this kind of uh, emergent uh, properties. So for me that's uh, like a, a prototypical complex system. Now in 2006 the European Union posed the following question. 
They said if we could spend if we could spend one billion euro on stopping the HIV AIDS epidemic, um, should we spend that on getting better medicine or should we spend it on changing our lifestyle? Now, if you look at this question for a few seconds, it, it's baffling because, I mean, from medicine to lifestyle, right? If I talk about medicine, I have to think about, you know, how I discover certain molecules that have certain interactions with certain patients, which is really, you know, very molecular based and also, you know, the toxicity and all those kinds of things. And if you talk about lifestyle, well, we talk about, you know, whether people have safe sex or not in case of HIV or in case of influenza. Uh, you know, have to study like mobility patterns, etc. So that is that's really going across all scales. And um, so we set out to try to give an answer to that question. And the approach that we have taken there was the following: we said, okay, let's. The first thing we did was looking at what, what's the data we have available. So what kind of data? Can, because you can model life, the universe, and everything. And we all know that the answer is 42, and it doesn't help. Right. Um, so the first thing you have to do is where is the data? And based on that, you can start to think, okay, where, where can I make my models? Because if I make models and I have no data to validate, it doesn't work. Of course, I can do theoretical experiments, but that's not the thing that the, the European Union would like to see. They would like to see something based on real data, predicting real things. Okay, so the first thing we did is where is the data? So we found data on molecular level, from data on the Im immunological level, from data on the cellular level, uh, all the way, of course, all up to uh, surveys that were done between um, uh, with uh, with patients, uh, but also the uh, molecular information of the virus, etc. So based on that, we decided to kind of stratify the problem in different layers and look at each layer: where is the data and what kind of model we can do. And I'll take you through that. Um, so the question about HIV, you already saw how, um, how big the incidence is, the, the, the inc uh, increase in infections. Um, but here is the, uh, is the overall graph from uh, about the 90s till where we are now. And you see that it's still pretty much growing. We're about 35 million people in the world are infected with HIV. Um, this is an underestimate, because we know that a lot of people do not know that they are infected. Um, and uh, so it's an underestimate, and the guess, the guess is that it's about uh, between 10 and 20 percent higher. So we, we, we expect something like 40 million people infected in the world, and the colors here, of course, indicate uh, the incidence and the prevalence. Um, okay, so if you want to understand this, if you want to understand the, the, the basics of HIV, and if you want to give an answer to this question, you know, should we have better drugs or should we have um, uh, better medicine or, or change behavior, you have to look into the, um, into the social components, which is what we do. So it's not only looking at the molecular level and on the immune, immune response, which is pretty, pretty important, of course, but you also have to look uh, at, uh, at, at the basic transmission mechanism, which is sexual transmission. Okay, so the steps ahead in this talk are the following. The first thing we need to do, remember we, we look for the data and then we look for the models that, that can try to understand, retrodict and predict um, what's happening. So the first thing we need to do is we need to be able to infer what kind of sexual network actually accurately describes HIV transmission. Now we did a lot of studies on that. and. Um, um, so the first study, which I'm not going to talk about, the first study we did was just we went to the Center of Disease Control in Atlanta. We, we dug into their databases where there's a lot of information about uh, from surveys with, uh, with, with uh, well, all kinds of surveys. Uh, we dug into their databases and from that we tried to distill this famous gamma that I was talking about for homosexual, heterosexual and drug users. Um, that, that worked well. We did, we did do some nice things with that. But that actually showed that we had a serious bias. So we said, okay, let's have a different look at it, such that we can actually look at integrating the genetic, the molecular, the medical, and the behavioral information in, in a sensible way. So I'll show you how we do that. And then, of course, um, we have to validate it against historical data and evolve it over time to do really predictions. And then, of course, the famous question <laughs> that comes up is, you know, 
once I'm able to predict what's happening, um, you know, the European will not be happy with just saying, okay, this is going to go the wrong way if I, if I come up with something that cannot be controlled. So the, the, the question here is, when I understand what's happening here, can I also influence it? Now, this is a very hard question. This is a very hard fundamental question. And Jan pointed out already in a meeting we had a couple of times ago, a couple of days ago, he said, you know, if you can control a complex network, it's not complex anymore. Well, I'm not 100% sure if that is true. That's a thing that we have to discuss, we have to think about. But it's clear that these things are pretty complex. And it might be that we can find points where we can actually tune the, um, uh, the evolution of the state of the network, which is the state of the transmission, um, in a way that we think is useful. And I'll show it to you. But it's not, it's not an easy exercise. So what we do is, um, so what I'm going to show you is data that we had from uh, three locations, uh, from San Francisco, from um, uh, Amsterdam, and from Rome, and yeah, from the large areas there, large regions there. And what we did is we, uh, we had, so we had patient data, which just assumed that everybody was connected to everybody, which is not true, of course. So we, and, 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 and uh, HIV, Simulation that means that everybody was having having sex with everybody. Well, it's a wild world out there, but not that wild. So, um, so we assumed everybody was doing it with everybody. That that was the starting point, and then we applied filters. So instead of going to the center of disease control and looking to the surface, we said just everybody is doing it with everybody, um, but then apply filters based on let's say sociological and later on uh, uh, genetic information. Um, and these filters can, can be, you know, uh, first of all, whether they're heterosexual, whether they're homosexual. So if they're homosexual, we don't expect that uh, a man will have sex with a woman, so that, you know, that cuts out one of the links. Um, then um, uh, also genetic information. So we kind of went through that. So that way you can reduce this uh, fully connected network for this real data into uh, uh, into subpopulations, uh, sub which is shown over here. So we start with a fully connected network. Uh, we evolve it um, with respect to those uh, filters I was talking about, also demographic filters, and a lot of stuff which I'm not talking about here, which is under the hood. Um, and then you get out the three populations, and the populations here are the, uh, this, is the uh, this is the drug users, this is the heterosexual population, and this is the homosexual population. So we are actually able to kind of distill without much assumptions at all, um, three sub-networks which we can study further. And of course, if we can analyze those networks and look at all these you know, topological characteristics that I was uh, talking about. Okay, so um, once that's done, then because we have information of those individuals, we can look at things like the uh, serial conversion time. So that's the time where they were first um, uh, diagnosed having HIV. So we know that's approximation of the time that they were infected. Approximation, of course, because it's not always completely like that. Uh, and okay, so then th this is labeled like that. So here you see that uh, so the red colors indicate uh, you know, more recent and the green ones indicate more uh, old infections. This is extremely important to have this information. It's extremely important because eventually the problem with HIV is the transmission of resistant viruses. And the resistance comes from different points in time where we had different drugs, because different drugs will activate different mutations in the, in the uh, population. So having a good layout in those subcrafts uh, of, uh, of, of the temporal aspects of the inf infection is, is extremely important. Um, and then the next step we did is say, OK, now once we have this, what we call a social sexual network, which is the left panel, um, we're actually going to dig into the um, virus genetics um, and look at the, uh, what's called the phylogenetic tree, which is, if you like, a, uh, uh, a tree of life of the virus. So it, is, it, it tells you something about how different mutations percolate over time through the, through the total virus population. And what you can do, and I'm, I'm skipping the technical <coughs> details there, what you can do is just combine these two um, and then distill from that, the, uh, or infer from that, remember we were inferring a network, infer from that the networks that you're interested in. So from that we could infer the MSM stands for men having sex with men, so that's the homosexual population. Um, 
Um, we could infer the MSM uh, 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 scale-free graph. Um, where you actually look at this is the degree, this is the amount of connections, the amount of sexual contacts that they have over the year, and this is like a uh, probability that they have it like that. This is extremely useful information because this is the input to our model. You know, this, I, I was just showing you data analysis here, not any modeling yet. This is just giving this tremendous amount of information, genetic information, social information, demographic information. What comes out of it is this. And this is what I need to do my model, to build my model. So how do I model? Peter, before you go on, just a couple of clarifying questions. So was there not a paper by Gene Stanley and uh, Frederick in Nature right. about this several years ago? Yeah, but it was then attacked by the statisticians, Hancock and these guys. That's right. But that was not about HIV. That was about influenza. No, no. There's actually there's, there's one about heavy tail networks of male and MSM networks. So the MSM, there's, there's, there's a lot of, lot of work in MSM. This is this still, I'm not modeling it yet, right? I'm just distilling this information. So this is, when we look into, um, so if we, if we look into the three populations I was talking about, Rome, Amsterdam, and San Francisco, this is what comes out of it. And there's no debate, it's just, just analyzing it. Um, but if you would compare that with the, the gammas that you will find if you directly go to the center of disease control, you'll find the difference there. And Nobody really knows where the difference comes from. So there is, yeah, of course, there's always inserting in those things. Yeah. Okay, I'll all members that the, uh, the statisticians in the university, I mean, the epidemiological statisticians, complain that um, they, 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 they thought that it sh should not be a heavy tail distribution. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a different point. That's a different point. Yeah, um, that actually, what we find is um, for the heterosexuals, it's not a scale free distribution. That's correct. Um, but the homosexuals are scale free. But uh, maybe you, you're referring to the heterosexual population. The heterosexual, that's true. You will, you will not find. So this is a very beautiful method by, designed by Mark Newman to correctly identify whether it's scale free or not. Homosexual, yes. Heterosexual, no. Yeah. Okay, that's a good point. Um, I mean, but still, you can simulate it, of course. Okay, so how do you how do you simulate it? And so now you have pretty good knowledge of of how, how such a network is uh, uh, what what, what it's looking what it's look like what it looks like. Um, now what you can do then is actually generate a network, just like I was showing you with this balloon uh, animation. You can actually generate a network, um, and you can generate all kinds of nice details in such a network. So what we have here, this is, a, this is an individual, the individual is infected, it has a sexual contact with, with another individual, uh, and it prop propagates, if you like, the fire <coughs> through, the, through the network. So basically what you, can use, what you can do, and it was already studied quite extensively by Vespagnini, um, what you can do is actually use the complex network to simulate the classical, uh, as it's called, uh, uh, SIR model, so, uh, uh, susceptible infected from recovery, although recovery doesn't happen in, uh, in HIV. Um, but you can do a bit more. And um, this graph is pretty complex. Um, I'm not going to go into the details, but I'll just take you through it very briefly. This is what we did. Um, so given this network that I just showed you, so did this previous thing here. So this network, which actually built this homosexual uh, connectivity, um, we went into all the possible details we could think of. So for instance, one thing we did is we did molecular dynamic simulation for uh, a certain protein. There are actually three proteins which are pretty important, which is reverse transcriptase, which is the protein that takes the RNA into the DNA. Um, which is the integrase, which is a protein that actually integrates DNA into the cell of the host. Um, and so the DNA that was transferred from RNA from the virus. Uh, and this protein called protease, it actually buds new viruses. And for each of those proteins, there are medi there's medicine, there are drugs. Now, what we simulated extensively for the 24 drugs that are available uh, for these classes of proteins, we simulate on a molecular level um, the binding affinity of these typical molecules to, to those proteins. And you can easily imagine, so this, let's say there's a transcription protein, right, that transcribes that the virus comes into the, uh, into the white blood cell, it spits out its proteins and its, uh, its RNA, the RNA needs, needs to be transformed into DNA before it can be inserted into the cell. And this, this is done by reverse transcriptase, which has a certain third three-dimensional structure. Um, and then the drugs, they actually sit on the active site and so you, the medicine comes in, that sits on the active side of the reverse transcriptase. And as a consequence, this thing cannot work anymore. So that's actually, it's just blocking, it's like putting a cork into a bottle. From that point on, you cannot do anything with it anymore. 
Um, so if that thing doesn't fit well and it walks out, then the, then the medicine doesn't work. So what you want to know is, and that's not a binary thing, it's, it's not just it works when it doesn't work, what you want to know is the actual binding affinity, so how good does it work in terms of from zero to nothing to 100%. So this is what we did extensively, ex extensive study together with uh, Peter Coffin from UCL. Uh, extensive study of all those proteins and all those, uh, all those drugs. Uh, and here's another example of how, what it looks like. Um, so this molecular dynamic simulation. Another thing what we did is um, simulating the immune system. Uh, we did that by a cell automata simulation. Again, I'm not going to give the details there, but here you see some results. And it's pretty interesting because I need your attention here. Uh, it's pretty interesting to see the dynamics there. So this is the HIV dynamics, which is simulated and validated against data, of course. Again, I'm not going to go through the details of the simulation. But the result is that we can actually, after the primary infection, so here we have weeks and here we have years. After the primary infection, what you see is the black balls are the, uh, is the virus. Um, you see that the virus actually numbers explode. So maybe I didn't mention that, but after a primary infection with HIV, um, you have about you get about something like um, uh, four million new virus particles uh, per day, per individual. So it's really an explosion of viruses, which is what you're seeing here. Um, at the same time, the immune system, which is identified by uh, uh, CD4, which is a molecule that sits on your T lymphocytes, um, see the, the immune system starts to crash. That's the, these white squares here. Um, and then the immune system recovers a bit and the fire seems to go away. Now this would be, if I stop here, this would be like influenza, right? Uh, because basically the virus seems to go, have gone away and the immune system seems to recover. But then I don't look here. If I look for HIV, the thing happens that the, the virus starts to hide in the lymph nodes. Um, it, it's not completely depleted. And the immune system, although it, started, it first starts to recover, then uh, crashes. And this is the latent phase. So here we have the uh, primary infection phase. Then we have the latent phase, and eventually we get the opportunistic disease phase, which is the AIDS phase here, where the, the complete immune system crashes, and virus takes over, and people die from things like, you know, typically things like, uh, like cancer. And, um, but, th but that's typically happening in this area here, because there's no uh, resistance anymore. Um, and this, we can, this is pretty accurate simulation of what's happening in patients. We know that because we compare it with the data. Now, why am I telling you this? Not only because we are proud that we can do this, <laughs> but also because we need to do this. Because if I want to simulate this network, right, I want to go, I want to open up a ball like that, which is an individual, which is a patient, and just look what's in there. Because each individual, each agent, has a completely different thing. You know, it has a different stage of where he is in, uh, he or she is um, in this HIV dynamic graph. A different stage of after infection. If it's here or there, it makes it all the difference. If it's just infected, then of course the viral load will be very high, so the tr possibility of transmission will be very high. There's much virusy, so after sexual contact, there's much uh, probability, possibility of transmission. Um, so that's one thing that you want to know. But also, for instance, if, if a patient is treated, and if he's treated with what he is treated, or she is treated, because then we can say, okay, look, we go back to our molecular simulation that says, okay, if you are treated with this, for let's say with the first transcriptase, with a uh, drug number 23, um, then we know that the binding affinity of that drug is that and that high, so that means that the viral reduction will be approximately like that, which means that the probability of transmission will probably be like that. So we can really link, and this, the first time we did this, I found it pretty amazing. We can really link the molecular binding affinity to the probability of transmission in a population. Um, that, that's pretty, uh, pretty interesting, but that's what you need. And here, um, so for each of the nodes, so this, is, this is actually what you see when you open up such an agent in this network. You open an agent and then you see this. Uh, and in the H and then we get things about whether people know that they're infected, do not know that they're infected, and what kind of treatment they're getting. This is what we plug in. From that we calculate what will be the viral load, from which we can calculate the, the probability of transmission. Okay. But then the thing that is missing, and which has proven to be the most difficult thing, is the link dynamics. Is namely, I mean, if I, it's good that I know what is the viral load of this individual and that individual, but if they never meet, who cares? 
But if they do meet, if they do have a sexual contact, I want to know, you know what's happening there. So the point is I have to find out um, you know, what is the dynamics in that network, what is the, you know, the connectivity doing there. So we did extensive study there with, uh, with sociologists um, and with uh, a medical social group, actually. Um, and the kind of things you want to ask yourself is, OK, over time, um, what is the probability that an individual has a contact with another individual? And how does that depend on his, um, whether he's homosexual, heterosexual, or on, his, uh, on the history of, of his relation? And, um, and let me give you one example that, that we discovered was that um, in a homosexual population, if someone considers his partner to be a stable partner, so someone that he uh, considers to be uh, really connected to, um, then the probability of having a other sexual partner in a year is 80%. This is in the case of a stable relationship. So in an unstable relationship, it's 100%. <laughs> and we know from our network analysis that the number of contacts in the homosexual populations that we studied at the tree can go up like uh, 200 different partners per year. Um, I can actually go higher than that, but this is like a typical number we're talking about. OK, so this kind of information we, we got from all the studies, etc. We integrated into tri tri relatively simple uh, equations. It is just one example that is, again, if you open up, uh, uh, not the nodes, but now you open up the links, uh, it looks like this. Uh, so this has something about the probability of transmission after having a sexual connection between number i and j is like the probability uh, of whether of this is the partnership probability. So that says if you have a steady partner or no steady partner. Uh, something about uh, the treatment factor, you know, whether you have to have drugs or not. That's not a medical statement, that's a social statement. Ah, I should explain this. Um, if the, the treatment reduction factor says, if someone, um, that we also cut from, from sociological studies, if someone is infected and he knows that he is infected, and when he has drugs, he knows that he's infected, right? Because he's using the drugs, his medicine, um, then they will change their behavior. Because they know that they are infected and they are, are taking more care of their relations. So we have uh, actually here, uh, you know, kind of behavioral components. Okay, so these things we can we can plug in. And um, and then what you can then what you can do is, given this information, you have the node dynamics, we have the link dynamics, now we can put things together and say, okay, let's see how the disease progresses and let's see if we can predict. Um, the, uh, the progress of the disease, and whether we can answer the question of the European Union. That is, better drugs, better medicine, or um, uh, the, uh, changing uh, behavior. Um, now, before I do that, before I give you that, uh, the answer to that question, at least our answer to that question, I first need to know what, how we're doing on time. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. Um, we're on 15 minutes more. Okay. Uh, I need 10 minutes at max. Um, so the first thing you need to know, first thing I want to tell you now is, um, before I come to this answer, um, is, okay, assume that I have a good description in terms of this complex agent network, assume. Um, uh, will I then be able to control it? Will I be able to say, OK, the network is in this state. So the whole, the whole total complexity I've shown you, all the way from the molecule to the social interaction, defines the state of that network at a certain point in time. Will I be able to control it? Now, this is proven to be a pretty hard uh, question. And, and, and the answer is also pretty hard. Um, and in a paper in Nature uh, this year, uh, Borobashi and, uh, and a couple other people uh, showed that contrast to what you would expect, the behavior of controllability is, um, is not, is not um, centered around the hubs in the network. <coughs> and it's not centered about, let's say, the low, uh, low connected nodes, but something in between. So let me explain it. Maybe I should do it with the hand waving here. OK, here we go. So we have, uh, we have a network. So we have all those balls and all the connections. 
and we define the state of which it is. So there is a certain communication going on, there is a certain links, link dynamics going on, and there is a certain state of each node going on. Now, what I do is I just fine tune some of those of these bits and pieces, or I, I strengthen a connection, I remove a connection, whatever you want, and just move the whole network into a different state, right? So what they ask themselves is the following question, okay, if we can move this network from one state to another state, um, how will that process be influenced by taking out different nodes of the network, almost comparable to what I was doing, like shooting at those balls, but then slightly different because they really look at the evolution of the network over time. So, okay, so if I take out nodes, you would expect, at least that's what everybody expects me to, is um, if I have a network, I transfer it to another state, and I shoot out these big balls, I would expect that that is more sensitive to, um, to frustrating this process and getting it in the same state again, as, for instance, shooting out the, the small nodes. Well, they didn't find that. They found, actually, um, that the controllability of those complex networks is not driven by the hubs. They don't give an explanation. They actually say we don't understand, but that's what we observe through this uh, uh, analysis. This is not data analysis, this is a model. Um, they use pretty sophisticated uh, methods for that. But again, okay, the answer, why? So that would be frustrating for me at least, because that would mean if I cannot control it, even though I can tell the European Union, you know, it's this or that uh, aspect, you know, that, that drives the network, there's no way you can control it into a different state. So we did an um, extensive study of that, trying to understand that. Actually, um, yeah, really pretty serious amount of time we spent on that. And um, the approach that we took was a slightly different approach that other people are, are taking, um, which is we looked at the whole network as an information processing system. Once we had that idea, it could it gave us an enormous set of tools, namely information theoretical tools, to, um, to, in, to, to, to study what's happening in a network. But then we study it from the point of view of information transmission. So that's, that's shown in this uh, little uh, uh, drawing here. So this is the network. This is the way we look at it, right? So we look at the network. This is some, there's some kind of connectivity network. There are, are, are nodes, etc. There might be hubs, there might be in the peripheral, whatever. Um, this is like a kind of a Minkowski cone, for those who, who come from physics, kind of Minkowski cone of how, you know, the information that is contained in a certain node, how that diffuses, if you like, through the network. Okay, so this is the way we look at it. This is our concept, looking at information and information diffusion uh, in the network. And now without going into the details how we did that, um, we, or how, how the, let's say the theory behind it, I'll show you the, the, the practical thing what we did there. So what we did is we, we, we took a network, um, here it is, uh, which has this topology structure that I was talking about, so the scale-free uh, topological structure. We took that network and we put on that network, instead of a complicated agent that, you know, with all these 10,000 parameters, a very simple agent, namely a spin. Um, so that's a thing that can be up or down, it can be zero or one, it can be blue or yellow, whatever you want, just two states. Um, so we have, on, on the whole network we have spins. And then, you do, doing that actually opened up another can of uh, methods and theory, namely from the theoretical physics, the Ising spin, uh, which is very well studied in thermodynamics. So we could actually use all these methods there to understand how um, Changing a spin somewhere in the network, so flipping it from up to down, how did it affect the spins further down the chain of that network, which is identified, you know, uh, depicted here. So here, for instance, a spin with a certain amount of information in that network, and then over time, this is time one times step two, over time that information is being shared with its neighbors, uh, etc., etc. So what we did, we, we, we created a network, we threw those spins over it, and um, we did the, the famous uh, uh, Clauber dynamics just to study the way, um, uh, you know, this, this kind of long correlations uh, emerge. Um, and then we rolled the whole thing back in time. So you just evolve it over time, you, you store every step that you make, and then you go back in time and you measure the mutual uh, information in the system. Um, and then you can actually calculate a thing what we call, um, just a term that we, that we threw, threw in there, um, 
uh, the information dissipation in the network. And if you measure that, it looks like this. And this was uh, a kind of an interesting thing for us. Um, so this is after thousands and thousands and thousands of simulations. Um, and what you see here is this information dissipation. So the amount of information that is that a note that you can know about a note, or that a note can know about another note, um, uh, set out against the degree of the, that note. So, and this is for different temperatures. So let's just look at the uh, upper panel left here. So what we see is that the information dissipation um, is not the highest for the lowest degree. It's not the highest for the highest degree, but it's somewhere in between. So we think, um, this is you know this is a thing that we, we haven't even published it, we are now writing it down. Um, this is, th we think that this might be the explanation for this, what I call paradoxic par paradox. So it seems, and here I summarized it, it seems that a way to look at this is that, um, that for the high degree nodes, so that's like the, uh, the hubs, right? So for high degree nodes, that, that the information that they have, because they are highly connected, is almost deterministic. The whole information that they have had, or that they had at a certain point in time, is known by the whole network because they were connected to the whole network. So the information they have is shared basically at after, after some, some time, is shared by the whole network. So that means that, um, that it actually uh, becomes uh, deterministic. The lower states, the lowest degree nodes, the, if you look at the nodes that are in the peripherals so with, with small connections, um, they are completely driven by noise. So it's just a bit of noise, then they will actually lose their information. And that, that the, the, the network doesn't store, if you like, the information of those local degree nodes. So that seems, you know, that, that's what, we, what that's we're observing. So it seems that this intermediate thing between this randomness at the peripheral area of the network and the determinism, which is due to the, which is a consequence of these high connected nodes, that actually somewhere in between is where the actual information trans uh, uh, transmission takes place. So it's somewhere in between the hubs, and the, it's a bit, of, a bit of a complicated concept here. I'm happy to talk about this later, but this is the idea. So the idea is that we think we have an explanation of the observation of Barabasi in terms of the fact that the information dissipation is optimal um, just beyond the highly connected nodes. Okay, that means that we can make our final step. So we, that means that we have some trust now in the fact that we can, once we have distilled the, the dynamics of the network, we are, might, might be able to actually control it. So um, here's some work uh, to show that. So what we did is, given this homosexual population I was talking about, given this homosexual population I was talking about, um, we looked at the AIDS data, and this is the, these, are the, these are the reported data. We applied the model that I was talking about. Remember, that was, before I started to talk about this, that was this model. Here we go. This one, and, uh, and the one with the, uh, with the, red, bo with the red bulbs. And, um, so, and then we were actually able to pretty accurately uh, retrodict the, the outbreak of AIDS from the 80s uh, to 2005 or so. Um, so this is the model, the results of the model, the red line and the blue one are the data. That gives us confidence that we're doing something sensible here, right? So we are able to retrodict what's happened. Um, the point is then, of course, that with that confidence you can make more steps and you can start to do run scenarios, asking yourself questions as what would happen if the responsible behavior, oh, there's something missing here, uh, <laughs> what would happen if the responsible behavior, uh, if we change that? And uh, what would happen if we have uh, reduced treatment, like you know someone is, is, is using less drugs, etc. And then you get these kind of scenarios uh, coming out of it. So you can actually predict. Now, of course, I don't have the links anymore. So, oh, it's not that shadow. Anyway, the, it, it probably it's like this that um, um, if you have uh, the reason the result was that if you have more responsible behavior, that's the that's the green line, and you're on the lower side of the uh, of the incidence of the infection. You, you, you got that? So the point is that you, once you have, are convinced that you're doing the right thing, you can play with these parameters that, that I've showed you, all the parameters about the transmission probability and the behavior characteristics, etc., and then ask yourself what-if questions. Um, so 
we did that for these uh, for these big cities I was talking about, these three big cities. Um, we published that uh, uh, this year, in 2011. Uh, here's an example for the uh, um, uh, Amsterdam cohort. This is the, the co cohort of, of homosexuals in, in Amsterdam, with the prediction that the incidence is actually growing. And um, um, so we, because we are here, right, in, in the growing range, range. Which we predicted, the paper was submitted in, 20, in 2010, and uh, last month, um, the data, new data became available of the incidents in Amsterdam, and it actually confirmed, we, it actually confirmed our, our prediction. So um, that, that is quite, uh, well, we were quite happy with that. Um, here is a bit more detail where you can play around with these kind of uh, uh, questions. You're looking at different scenarios. Again, playing around with this question. I know I have three more minutes. I'm trying to fill them. <laughs> um, um, ask yourself this question, you know, is, is it better medicine or behavior? So you can tune the per behavior parameters, you can tune the demographic things, whatever. Um, and, uh, and then you can ask, you know, then you can look at the, 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 the prediction of what's going to happen there. Um, which we did. And um, the answer that we came up to with to the European question was, in large cities, th this is an important thing, we're just talking about large, uh, uh, dense cities, the social policies, that is changing behavior, completely outweigh the medical improvements. And the reason is pretty subtle, um, um, but one aspect that actually drives this is that the drugs, when they get better, uh, that means that the fire load goes down. And you say, okay, better drugs, fire load goes down, transmission less, so the problem is solved. No, because when the drugs get better, they also get less toxic, and they get less toxic, you feel, you feel better. That means that you don't, you're not aware anymore that you're ill, or you're, you, know, you hide it away, so to say, that's a psychological process. Um, and as a consequence, the, your risky behavior increases. That, will, that means that uh, you will have more uh, unprotected sexual con contacts, which then drives, of course, the, the disease again, even though the fire load is much lower. And so this balancing thing came out to this conclusion that, um, that the, the thing to do is, of course, still improving your medicine, but definitely focus on the, uh, uh, on the, on the social policies. So is that, is that parameterization of behavior in the model, Peter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, where, where do you get data for that? Oh, there's a lot of data for that. There's a lot, there's a tremendous amount of data of how people, for instance, the thing that I was just mentioning. Um, so people have rec recorded their, their temperature and, and their, um, how, how ill they were, how sick they were from, from different medicine, and how that changed the way they were, they were going through the city. And for this, there's a lot of information on that. Yeah, so this, and we can put that in, of course, because we have the general model. This is these, uh, these function and shows you. Um, Another thing that we found uh, in relation to that, and, and we haven't published, well, we have submitted it yesterday, um, is um, that doing this in combination with this is the best. And this is the test and treat, which means as soon as someone is identified with HIV, directly start treatment. Don't stop. Uh, this, is, this is a pretty subtle, subtle, subtle thing that I'm, that I'm not going to explain. But the bottom line is that we found in, in large populations, we found that um, there is a, co a direct correlation between the hubs, so the ones that have, are mostly connected, um, and the untreated period. So it seems that the people, this is a strange finding, it seems that the people from which we know that they are not treated are actually the ones who have most sexual contacts. It's pretty weird. It's complete, n nobody expected that. So the people that, have, uh, uh, that are not treated, so they know that they're ill, they know they're infected and they're not treated. These are the ones who have most contacts. Um, so if you take that into the simulation again, then you find that the combination of these two steps, these two steps will really um, basically stop the, stop the pandemic. You can actually stop it. Test and treat, changing behavior will stop the whole HIV pandemic in the world. There's no doubt about it, which is a new statement, I would say. OK, um, I think this is my second to last slide. Um, um, one other thing you can do with all the things that I just showed you is actually use it uh, as a kind of decision support system for, uh, for medical practi practitioners. Um, so that's what we did, and uh, parts and bits and pieces of that we already published in 2009, but we're still adding, of course, all the new things that we have there. 
Um, it's covered with two uh, patents uh, in um, uh, worldwide patents, actually. Uh, and we're running this system that I'm going to show you now um, in, in 12 European uh, uh, hospitals, me uh, academic medical hospitals. Um, so what I'm going to show you is using all the things that I talked to you about as a decision support system. So what we did, what we do is the following, we say, okay, there's a patient coming in, and from that patient we have uh, the genetic footprint of the virus that he carries along, which is important because from that genetic footprint we can decide what, how, what will be the efficacy of a certain drug. Remember the molecular dynamic thing? Um, so we get, let's say, the mutation pattern, and we get the viral load, and we get the CD4, which is a measure of the immune system, as you remember, the, the white squares in my HIV dynamics graph. So that's what we get from the patient. Then we go two ways. Uh, in this decision support system, we go two ways. One is uh, the data way, which is uh, uh, pretty, pretty simple. We developed a first-order logic text mining system to, to find the link between um, uh, mutations. So we just go to the literature, so give me the mutations, give me the drugs that are being used, and I predict what will be the efficacy of that drug. So that's just mining the literature. Well, and this, this is a crawler that's running day and night. While I'm talking, it has been crawling thousands and thousands of, uh, of PubMed papers. So from that we create a, uh, um, a prediction of what a certain medical, uh, what a certain uh, medicine will do for this specific patient. So that's data, it's not simulation. Uh, so hang on. Um, so here we are. And then the, that's the data path, if you like, to the right. And to the left we have the modeling part. We do the molecular dynamics for these specific mutations. I talked about that briefly. We do a, um, uh, an entry based, uh, an agent based entry simulation. I didn't talk about that, but we, you need to, when you talk about how the virus acts in the cell, you have to actually model it, how it gets to the cell, what's happening there. So we have a system for that, which I didn't discuss. We have a system to do the HIV uh, um, uh, immune response uh, thing. We have, of course, the complex network that I talked about today. And then we combine the whole thing into saying, okay, for this specific patient, for this one moment in time, this will be the best drug to give. And, and this is, like I said, being used now in 12 hospitals. Uh, we're working on a third patent to, to cover the uh, uh, IPR for that. Okay, last slide is this. Um, I, uh, of course, this is work that's not done in isolation, as was mentioned yesterday in front of isolation. Um, this is done with, with a lot of money, with a lot, with a lot of people. Um, and uh, particularly, I would like to mention um, the support from the, from the European Union in two projects, two large projects that I was happy to lead. One was Firelab, the other was Dynanets. Um, and money coming from the Russian Federation for this uh, leading scientist grant that was mentioned by, by Steve. Um, and of course, the collaboration with the people here in uh, NTU, which is very helpful, and people in Russia and in Amsterdam. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. But uh, we're running a little bit late, but uh, we have time for maybe one or two questions, if anybody has questions they want to ask. Yes. Yeah. Pete, I'm fascinated by that next, the, the next layer out from the hubs discussion. Is it like a, I mean, it looks like a kind of diffusion front, right? So it would matter the kind of dimensionality of, I mean, it looks to me, is, is, is that it's not what a diffusion. It is? No, the, the word diffusion might be misleading. Um, well, we, oh, we, diffusion we, on a network. It's not. It, it's not real diffusion of information. I think, right. although we we, we tossed that as a name, uh, because in, then then you see like a like a diffusion from. Right. Um, it is really the amount of information that one node can still have about another node. Um, so it's to some sense that that is a diffusion, but it's like a like a, it's a mutual information thing, right? right? It's a diffusion with a different measure. It's a diffusion with a different measure. We looked at different information metrics. Uh, right. I think I mentioned that to yeah, you. Yeah, to you. Yeah. So we looked at Salis and we looked at Shannon and we looked at all the other things, and they all come up with the same thing. So the information measure doesn't really matter, which is good news, I think. Yeah. Um, the question about. Uh, the, the, the scale of things, so we did networks of different sizes and uh, different commas, etc., and all came out with the same. Why don't you put it on a strict grid? Um, I don't yeah, know. Just right. Yeah, we did, we did do it on a strict grid. I don't, right. I don't think we did that much detail. I don't know. Right. I don't remember. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, well, we, we have plenty of time after the coffee break for further discussion anyway, so uh, I think okay. at that point, um, yeah. thank Perfect. you again, Peter. Yeah, I'm not sorry.